inviting me and also for having this amazing Parker Chess Club. It's really thanks to John that we have this. He's also <clears throat> a nationally renowned chess photographer who basically lives the life that I dream of. He gets to travel the world taking pictures of all the great players, including uh, uh, Nakamura, who Chris trains. And um, yeah, it's, it's really great to be here with all of you. Earl, thank you for coming. Another special guest who I want to recognize is future world champion Avyukt over there. Uh, so he's uh, one of my students, and um, he recently placed third in a high school competition. And Avyukt, you're in second grade now, is that right? So that's super impressive. So congratulations to you, Avyukt. Thank you. Um, all right, well, I would like to get started by talking about the theme of today's lesson, or lecture, I should say, conversation. And that's going to be planning, which I think is one of the most important words. You hear it thrown around all the time in chess. But I think very few people really know what it means. I'm not sure I entirely know what it means, but I have some idea, and I'm curious to hear your thoughts. If I were to ask you, what is a plan? You could, you could tell me what a plan is in life, or specifically over the chessboard. How would you define the word plan? Darshan? Like you uh, visualize it, uh, the, the board that you want to okay. be in, and like you and all the squares that uh, you would like for, like for it to be in, and um, find out a way to slowly get to that um, pre-position. Okay, very good. So what you're talking about when you say visualizing a position sort of at some point in the future, you're talking about like a dream position. That's what I call a, a dream position or a utopian position. It may not be one that you can achieve. It may not be realistic. But it's like your north star that points you in the right direction. I'm a big fan of utopian thinking. I actually wrote my master's thesis on it. Even though I'm a firm believer that it cannot ever be accomplished, but I think that sometimes dreaming big can help pull you in the right direction. So for example, if you know the ideal situation, the ideal position for each of your pieces, you might not be able to bring them all there. But if you can even get a few of them close, or just a few of them, let's say three out of the six pieces to the right squares, that can help you win. Any other definitions of what a plan is? Yes? An idea of how to do something. Good. And are you Cole? Good job, Cole. An idea of how to do something. So you may have a plan of what you want to be when you grow up. I always ask my students, in fact, in class earlier today, I asked what they want to be, and someone said he wanted to be a potato. So I said, okay, if you want to be a potato, you need to have a plan of how you can become one. You'd have to plant yourself in the soil, water yourself every day, get a lot of sunlight. It's the same in chess, right? It's not enough to just be thinking one step ahead. Even though one of the players of the game I'm going to show you, Capablanca, famously, when he was asked how many steps ahead he, he's able to think, he says, just one, but it's always the right one. But I think that he was maybe joking about that. You want to think more than one step ahead. Now, when you're calculating tactics, you also have to be thinking about what your opponent is doing. But when you're, when you're thinking about plans, when you're thinking about strategy, it's enough to think about general ideas of where you'd like your pieces to be in the future, even if there's no forcing combination that can bring you there. We'll talk a lot more about planning over the course of this game that I'm going to show you. And after the game, if we have time, I'll show you the story of King Charles, which also has to do with planning. Um, but I wanted to say that one definition of planning that I, that I particularly like comes from Jeremy Silman. I don't know if any of you have read or have heard of the book, Reassess Your Chess, by Jeremy Silman. That book I read when I was, I think, 12 years old, and my rating shot up about 300 points within a year. And I, I give a lot of credit to Jeremy Silman. He helped me a lot to understand the strategic side of chess. And when he talks about planning, he talks about imbalances. So an imbalance is something different in the position. Um, let's say, just as a very quick example, let's say that we have a situation like in the Sicilian defense, Rossellino variation over here, where we could already talk about some imbalances in this position. What would be one imbalance that favors white in this position? Something that's better about white's position than black's. Um, let's go with, and I don't know everyone's name, I apologize, but and I can't quite see the name tags, but go ahead, yes? Um, white is better because he doesn't have a line, two line pawns. Okay, good. So black has these double pawns. Black's pawn structure is a bit compromised. Is there anything better about black's position? Anybody like Black's position or can tell me one advantage that Black may have? Yes? Uh, bishop pair. The bishop pair. That's right. How much is 3 plus 3? No, it's not 6. 6.5 in the case of bishops. Right? If you have a knight plus a knight, that's 6. You have a knight plus a bishop, that's 6. Two bishops, 
are worth, I don't know if it's exactly right, approximately 6.5. How could that be if each bishop by itself is only worth three? Well, an analogy I, I like to use is of a car. A car may have an engine and a steering wheel and uh, some tires and a radiator, and that's all I know about cars. All right, so you have all of those things. Now, by themselves, they may not be very valuable. But when you put them together in the right configuration, you have a working car. It's the same with bishops. By themselves, they have a severe limitation, which is they can never change their colors. So eternally, they're stuck to half of the squares, but they can never get to the other half. That is not a limitation for the knight. In fact, the knight is always changing colors. But when the bishops are working together, they're worth more than the sum of their parts. The whole is greater than the individual parts added, because the bi one bishop controls the light squares, the other bishop controls the dark squares. They never trip over each other's toes. So having two bishops overall has been proven to be better in most positions than two knights or a knight and bishop. But keep in mind that everything I'm telling you now is not a rule. There are no rules in chess besides how the pieces move. Nothing is black and white in chess besides white pieces and black pieces, right? In chess, you always have to think for yourself. So are there cases in which it's good to have double pawns like these? Yes. Are there cases in which having the two bishops is actually a disadvantage and two knights can outplay the two bishops? Yes. But all else being equal, two bishops tend to be advantageous. And also bishops are like a good stock that just gains value with time. Because as the position opens up, which inevitably will happen, Right, because pieces will get traded. If the game lasts long enough, pieces come off the board. Who does that favor, the knights or the bishops, when the game opens up? Favors, uh, favors the? The bishops, because bishops thrive on an open board. Knights do better when there are a lot of pieces on the closed board. So that's just a very crude example where here we could say black has the worst pawn structure, but black has the two bishops. And sometimes based on the imbalances, the imbalances that favor white or the imbalances that favor black, that will help you come up with the best plan. Because according to Silman, a plan is nothing more than a sequence of ideas or a sequence of moves that will help you maximize your favorable imbalances and minimize your unfavorable ones. So any imbalance that favors the opponent, we want to minimize it. For example, if my opponent has um, has, right, has a big attack against me. And let's say my king is in a lot of danger. To minimize that imbalance, I might try trading queens. Because without a queen, their attack won't be so successful. If my opponent has worse pawn structure than me, again, I may trade queens because the pawns will matter more in the end game than they do in the opening. So depending on the imbalances, you want to focus on reaching a position that will emphasize your favorable imbalances and will minimize your opponent's favorable imbalances. And we're gonna see exactly that in this game. So, without further ado, let me set the stage. This is 1938, almost 100 years ago. This was played between three-time world champion Mikhail Botvinnik, and uh, his opponent was Jose Raul Capablanca. Raise your hand if you've heard of both of those players. All right, so these are two very, very famous players, and this is a very famous game. Uh, one of the most famous games, I would say, of all time. Botvinnik was a three-time world champion, he won the title in 1948, then he lost the title, then he won the title again, then he lost it again, then he won it again. So he, he's definitely one of the legends of chess, and he's sometimes called the patriarch, or the father of the Russian, like the Soviet in those days, the father of the Soviet chess school. He trained Karpov, Kasparov, Kramnik, and many other great champions. Um, he was playing white, but when he played this game, he was not yet the world champion. And his opponent, Capablanca, had already been the world champion and had lost the title 11 years earlier. So this was a battle between the past and the future. Botvinnik was the future, he was an, an up-and-coming rising star, and he played this game brilliantly. Um, and in fact, I once saw that a panel of grandmasters back in the 90s voted this as the greatest game of all time. So of course that's very subjective, but I think because of its historical value as well, um, especially because Botvinnik was playing the machine, who was once thought to be invincible. Capablanca lost fewer than 40 games in his whole life. 36. Uh, fewer than 30 games? He only lost 36 games. 36, that's, yeah, so fewer than 40. Yeah. In his professional career. Exactly, yeah, 36 games. He's one of my favorite players, too. Yeah, yeah, absolutely right. So 36, that's, that's exactly what I had thought, that he lost 36 games in his life, which is crazy to think about. So every time that you beat Capablanca, you have a, a big party, <laughs> a big celebration. And uh, this is a game that Botvinnik wrote notes on in his excellent book, 100 Selected Games, 
I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture that I learned more from Botvinnik than any other world champion. It's because I read that book when I was a kid. I read it cover to cover, one of, the, one of the few chess books that I actually read cover to cover, and I learned a tremendous amount. So I highly recommend um, 100 Selected Games by Botvinnik, or really any book by Botvinnik. I think he's one of the greatest chess authors of all time. So he played here d4. And for a strategic player, this is a very common move because strategic players often like more closed positions. Tactical players often like more open positions. The reason this is going to lead to relatively close positions by comparison is when you play d4, you want to follow up with e4. And when you play e4, you want to follow up with d4. So what's the difference? The difference is that getting d4 is easier. If you start with e4, it's easier to get in d4 than it is to get in e4. Why is that? Why would it be harder? Let's say you start with this move. Why would it be harder to get this move in later? All right, let's go with Abut. Because you can put d5 and stop it coming from me. Good, but if you play e4, can't I play e5 and stop d4 the same way? No. Why not? He can do d4, and if he can do a queen gets Exactly. The difference is that the d pawn is backed up by a queen. The e pawn is not backed up by a king. Obviously, you're not going to recapture with your king like this. But, and even if you could, you wouldn't want to do that, right? Because that would be a terrible idea to get your king out early. So d4 means that you'll probably have a harder time getting e4. And for similar reasons, black will have a harder time getting e5. So it's harder to open up the position, which means we have a more closed position, which lends itself well to strategy and thinking in terms of plans. Well, let's move forward. Black played knight to f6, immediately stopping e4. And here's an example. Knight to c3 is not a very accurate move. Because after d5, black has such a clamp on this e4 square that it's going to be very hard for you to play the move e4. This move is so important that you're going to see Botvinnik organizing all of his resources, all of his energy around this one square in this game. Everything he does is for control of this square. And you'll see that coming up. But if we allow black to play d5, then it will be very hard to play e4. So remember that chess is not only about what we're trying to do ourselves. Chess is a two-player game. And I think a mistake that many beginner players make is they're so focused on their own brilliance, their own ingenuity, and they have this amazingly ingenious plan, which is like 20 moves deep. But on move two, they get checkmated because they forget that they have an opponent who's trying to stop them. So remember that chess is not only the art of executing your own brilliant ideas. It's also the art of prophylaxis, preventing your opponent from executing theirs. How can we try to prevent black from playing d5? E, uh, cool. C4. C4, very good. And why does it prevent d5? Because if black plays d5, who can tell me what white would do now if black plays d5? We have a very simple solution. Uh, remind me your name? Sia. Yeah, Sia. Go ahead. Yes, and Sia, you won a, a trophy, didn't you, in the tournament? So we have another special guest here. Sia was chess queen, am I right? Chess queen in our chess tournament. And what grade are you in? First grade. First grade. That's super impressive, Sia. Congratulations. You just take the pawn. And the problem is, taking with a knight or with a queen, both surrender the center for black. For example, let's say we take with a knight. Who's better, a pawn or a knight? Well, a knight. But who's better at defending squares? Uh, Sorry, I mean pawn. The pawn. Pawns are the best defenders. They may be the smallest piece, and it's precisely because they're the smallest, it's precisely because they're the weakest, that nobody wants to trade themselves for a measly pawn. So they wear their weakness as a badge of honor. They're like, yeah, that's what I thought. You better run away from me. Because nobody wants to mess with a pawn. A knight doesn't want to mess with a pawn. A queen doesn't want to mess with a pawn. If I have one pawn defending a square, and I give black I don't know, five pieces defending that same square. Who really controls that square, white or black? Abhut? White. White does. Because do any of these pieces want to go here? No. No, none of them want to trade themselves for a pawn. So pawns are extremely important, or impotent, shall we say. Because with pawns, they will help you control the key squares. And to be more specific, the key central squares early in the game. That's what you want to fight for, is the center. Pawns will help you control that better than anything. So in this position, if black plays knight to f6, we'll just take. And if the knight takes the pawn, how can white now dominate the center? It's a very strong move here for white. Go ahead. Yes. 
E4. E4, very good. And we have what we call the CPD, which is not the Colorado Police Department, but the Central Pawn Duo. So we're attacking the knight, open lines for both bishops, and tremendous control in the center. Also, the knight now has to move for a third time. Imagine you're running in a race, moving the same, uh, if you're running in a race and hopping on the same foot over and over and over again. You're not gonna win that race. Same in chess. If you're trying to develop your pieces quickly, using the same knight over and over and over again is not gonna help you win the race for development. Here, white can just bring out a new piece, and white has a comfortable advantage. So you won't really see grandmasters playing this way with black. Similarly, if black takes back the pawn in this position, if black takes with a queen, this may look good for black. They have a knight out, they have a queen out, but what's the problem? What can white do here? Yes? Very good, knight to c3 PO. And now the queen has to move somewhere, and then we can still get the CPD, the central pawn duo, and black had to move the same queen twice, but most important, we have two central pawns to one. And this is gonna be a very important theme in this entire lecture, is the theme of how pawns can influence the position of your pieces. A lot of times when people are coming up with plans, they make the mistake of only looking at their pieces, and only thinking where their pieces wanna go. But the interplay between pawns and pieces is very important. The pawns are kind of like, they, they have the Da Vinci Code. They have within them the secret of which side of the board you should attack and where your pieces should be placed. So understanding the pawn structure will give you the golden key to understanding where to put your pieces. All right, let's pick up the pace a little bit. So after knight to f6, c4, black plays e6, preparing d5, at least that's one thing he's preparing, because now he's defended by a pawn. So he'll be able to maintain pawn control in the center. White played knight to c3, preparing not the cpd, but the cp3, the central pawn trio. And black defends this square with this bishop. Isn't that a paradox? How can a dark squared bishop ever defend a light square? This is where you need to think about pieces holistically. They're fluid. They're not just on the squares that they're on, but they can impact other squares even if they'll never go to those squares themselves. Yes? You pin the knight, very good. Bishop to b4. So how is the bishop helping black defend this square? Because pinned pieces don't protect. If white plays e4, how many defenders does white have on that pawn? Yes? Zero. A big fat goose egg, zero. Black would just play knight takes pawn and you can't take back. Because again, uh, unless like some of my students in today's class, we're doing king sacrifices, but I don't recommend sacrificing the king. It hasn't worked out very well for me. So, this position, bishop e4, pinning down the knight. Does anyone know the name of this opening? I consider it the gold standard for black of all ways to defend against d4. I think this is maybe the most respected. It's been played in most world championships. It has the best record statistically. What is it called? The Nimzo Indian. The Nimzo Indian, named after? Nimzo, Nimzovich. Aaron Nimzovich was a great theorist. He wrote My System, another great book. And uh, why are all these openings called the Indian defenses? Like Nimzo Indian, King's Indian, Queen's Indian, Bogo Indian. Anyone know the story behind that? Yes? Um, Indian, the definition of Indian defense is something that instead of controlling the center with pawn, instead of occupying the center with pawns, yes. your piece is controlled. That's very impressive that you know that, Cole. But it doesn't answer the question of why it's an Indian defense, where the word Indian came from. Yes? Chess is from India, but this is actually a different kind of Indian. This is referring to Native Americans, uh, who should be called Native Americans, not Indians. But back, uh, back when all of these defenses were given their names, there, were, there was a big battle between two schools of thought. The classical school, which said you have to just put your pieces straight in the middle and get a big pawn center and develop your pieces to the middle, castle your king and do everything by the book. And then there was the hypermodern school, which Nimzovich was like the, the, the pope of that school. He was the great leader of, of, of the people who believed that you could attack the middle from the sides, and that sometimes you could bring your knight out to the edge of the board, and that sometimes you could violate all sorts of rules. You could delay castling, and you could do other things that seemed totally ridiculous to the class, classical school. So the players who were Nimzovich's enemies they said, I'm gonna call your opening the Indian defense, which was very racist because they were saying like, it's backward, like the Native American Indian defense, backward. And Nimzovich wore it as a badge of honor. He said, thank you very much. We now have our own opening name. I'll call it the Nimzo Indian. 
And, and that now it's actually the most respected opening, or one of the most respected openings in the world, alongside the Queen's Indian and many of the other Indian defenses. Uh, so Bishop e4, pinning the knight to the king. White plays e3, because he can't play e4, since it would just get taken, as we saw. But what is the drawback of this move? Every single move has a drawback. Even the best moves have drawbacks. Anirudh? Um, what is the drawback? Yeah, what is the bad thing about the move e3? It does, it does, it, it defends this pawn. I'll be very disappointed if nobody sees it. Yes? It, 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 um, blocks in your bishop. it blocks in your bishop, right? So this bishop right now has a pawn move. One move ago, he could have moved out, but now he's being blocked. And this may seem very strange for a player like Botvinnik, who is known to use his pieces harmoniously. He got, got his pieces to work together as a team. So I like to tell my students, teamwork makes the dream work. And chess is a team game. It's just you have to recognize who your teammates are. Your teammates are your pieces. So you would think it's a better idea to bring out the bishop first and then move the pawn. And in fact, many players, notably Boris Bosky, would play the Leningrad variation for that reason. Get out the bishop first and then advance the pawn. But you'll see that Botvinnik does not neglect this bishop. But he does for a while. But this bishop is actually the hero of the entire game. So sit tight. He didn't forget about that bishop. He plays e3. And Capablanca now plays d5. d5, controlling space in the center. Quick question for you guys. Can't White win a piece here? One way that you should know that there's a possible tactic in a position is that if you see an unprotected king, or a vulnerable king, sorry, a vulnerable king and an unprotected piece, there's a very good chance that you may have a tactic. A pin, a fork, a skewer, or some other tactic is in the position. So here, black has a vulnerable king and an unprotected bishop. What move am I talking about? Yes? Queen a4. No, I'm calling on him. Uh, to queen to a4. Queen to a4. And does that win a bishop? No. Yes? Uh, no, no, it doesn't. Because of knight to c6. Interestingly enough, Capablanca actually did blunder a piece much like this in a later tournament. Um, there's a funny story behind that that I won't go into now. But he didn't blunder here. Because with queen a4 check, the knight can simply block, and that defends. Remember, and this is mainly for the kids, if there are any beginners in the room, there are always three ways to get out of check. I call them the ABCs. A for away, B for block, C for capture. So don't think you have to move away. You can do a B for block or a C for capture. If you can't do an A for away, B for block, or C for capture, what is that called? Yes? D for dead. So queen to a4 check wins the bishop. No, it doesn't because the knight can block. But White didn't do that in this position. Instead, he played a3. And let's get some more participation from all of you. In the famous words of William Shakespeare, to take or not to take? That is the question. So I'll give you two choices. Bishop takes c3 or bishop to a5. Who votes for bishop takes c3? All right. Who votes for bishop to a5? All right, I see a lot of votes for bishop to a5. All right, the answer was bishop takes c3. So good job to those of you who voted for that one. But those of you who voted bishop to a4, uh, bishop to a5, sorry, new board, that seems very good. And I applaud you also because you're trying to keep the pin. You're right in thinking that the bishop is better than the knight in this position because the bishop is kind of the master of the knight. The knight is asking permission to move. And the bishop is like, you shall not pass. So the knight can't move at all, except very soon it's going to be the bishop who cannot move at all. Because what would we do right now, Darshan? Uh, b4, bishop b6, c5. b4, forcing the bishop to b6, and then c5. You can see how these pawn chains are extremely powerful at dominating the dark squares, so much so that they trap the bishop. So the bishop doesn't really have any choice. Going back this way would just be embarrassing. Taking, uh, going back this way would be a free trip to the bishop graveyard. So he has to play bishop takes knight, at least trade off the bishop. The bishop was better than the knight, but what did black get in exchange? By making that trade, what is now in black's favor? Yes? Uh, white has a double pawn. White has double pawns here, and white has an isolated pawn here. And also black has a lead in, let's make the next move for black, Black has a lead in what? Fill in the blank. A lead in... Yes? Um, 
Well, he has a leading castle. That's true. He has a leading castling. But castling is a part of what I'm talking about. Yes? Development. Black has a huge lead in development. Black has developed their knight. They developed this bishop earlier. White has not developed this knight or this bishop. Black has castled. White's not even close to castling. And on top of that, White has an isolated pawn here, a pawn that will never be defended by any other pawns for the rest of the game, unless it captures something, and double pawns here. And when you have double pawns, they kind of walk like this, right? They have a hard time, because the one in back is always blocked by the one in front. So all of this seems to favor Black, and yet White wins this game. This was a changing of the guard, where Botvinnik defeated the past world champion. But what advantage does White have in this position? What's one advantage for White? Yes? Okay, so the fact that we've doubled up the pawns may actually work in our favor because we've doubled them towards the center. They've captured towards the middle. For example, this one can take, and then if need be, we could bring another one to take that one as well. It's like the Terminator just cannot stop him, right? This one dies, but then another one comes right behind him. So you can have, you can view this as maybe two central pawns for black and maybe four central pawns for white at the moment. So the double pawns could be helpful, yes? Oh, White has the bishop here. We've already talked about 3 plus 3 equals 6.5. Now, right now, I wouldn't exactly call this 6.5. Right? This bishop is, um, yeah, it's seen better days. It's more of an overgrown pawn than a bishop at the moment. I mean, it's a very proud overgrown pawn, but it's still an overgrown pawn. But it will get to a better position later. And actually, this is our extra bishop. How, how do we know that that is our extra bishop? The bishop on c1 and not the bishop on f1. Uh, let's go to, I'm trying to call new people if I can, but uh, uh, back to Abhi, go ahead. Like, sometimes the white bishop is active, active than the black bishop. Yes, but why is this the extra bishop? Why is this the one that I call extra? Uh, yes, go ahead. See ya. You okay? Should I come back to you, or go ahead? Because the, it is on C1. Yes, it is on C1. That's very true. But I'm not talking about the specific square it's on. I'm talking about something else. Uh, yes, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it's blocked off by a bunch of pawns. Yeah, but that doesn't, the fact that it's a bad bishop doesn't mean that it's the extra bishop. What makes it the extra bishop? All right, go ahead. Um, the other... The opponent doesn't have a bishop. Exactly. Always look, when you have the bishop here and your opponent doesn't, always ask yourself which bishop is on a color that my opponent doesn't have. So black has a light squared bishop, but black does not have a dark squared bishop. In fact, if we start to look at the pawn structure, we can see more. These pawns are all controlling light squares. Black has no pawns out right now that are controlling dark squares. This knight is on a dark square, which means it controls light squares. This bishop will only control light squares. All of this, if you put all of this together, you don't need Sherlock Holmes to tell you that the dark squares could be a potential weakness for black. We already have an extra unit of force on the dark squares, and black's pawns are mainly controlling light squares. And since we now know that pawns are the best defenders, if they're not defending the dark squares, and add to that the fact that we have an extra dark square bishop, we might have excellent chances to attack on the dark squares later in this game. And in fact, that's exactly what happens. Yes? And also the black bishop is bad because the central pawns are on light squares? Exactly. Exactly right. Very good. Uh, the central pawns are on, are on light squares. Yeah, so that makes this bishop a bad bishop. That's a great point. And that's actually going to go into Capablanca's plan. So Capablanca recognizes that this is a bad bishop, and you'll see what he does about it very soon. Well, Botvinnik first trades off his doubled pawns. C takes d5. Black doesn't take with a knight or queen for reasons we mentioned earlier. Black wants to maintain a foothold or a stronghold in the center. So black takes with a pawn. That actually opens up the bad bishop. But why would he make that trade? Well, we no longer have double pawns. So we've eliminated a pawn weakness in that sense. But also, how many central pawns does white have? Two, if we're counting the DNA files as the center. And how many does black have? One. And two is more than one. Let that be the best lesson I've taught you today. We have double the pawn power in the center compared to black. So what does that mean? Well, if I told you earlier that pawns are the da Vinci code, they give you the clues for where to place your pieces. And more than that, they give you the clues for where to launch your attack. 
Where do you think Botvinnik is going to launch his attack in the future? On the queen side, the king side, or the center? Call it out. Well, the center. The center. The center. Because we have an extra central <laughs> pawn. And you might think, that's a pawn. Who cares about a pawn? But pawns defend squares better than anyone. Pawns chase other pieces away better than anyone. So if you have an extra pawn in the center, it's a great indication or a great clue that you should probably attack in the center of the board. All right. This next move, I think, is an amazing move, even though it's a very, very simple one. It's not a sacrifice, nothing flashy about it. But sometimes players, when they play chess, they just know that they have to develop their pieces. And they don't care what order they do it. So they're like, OK, I'll bring out my knight to f3, and then I'll bring my bishop to d2, and then I'll bring my bishop to d3, and then I'll castle, and then I'll tell my coach, give me a gold star, because I did everything correctly. But that's not exactly how the grandmasters play. They don't mindlessly aimlessly develop their pieces. They do develop, but there's a plan around their development. How many of you have had this happen before? Where you're playing a tournament game, or a practice game, and you bring out your pieces, you develop your knights, you develop your bishops, you castle, you control the middle, and you feel really good about yourself, and then you just have no clue how to continue. You're just sort of staring and you're like, well, I'm, yeah. So raise your hand if you've ever been in that situation. All right, it's quite a few of you, quite a few of you, right? And why does that happen? Because you know the basics, you know the ABCs, right? Development, control the middle, castle your king. But that doesn't tell you, that just tells you how to get started, but it doesn't really tell you how to continue. It doesn't tell you how you can evaluate those positions to come up with effective plans. And that's what this lesson is all about. But what I'm trying to impress upon you right now is that the thought of planning should not wait until after you've brought out your pieces. If you sometimes don't know what you, what you should do after you bring out your pieces, it could be because you brought out your pieces mindlessly in the first place. Yes, you brought them out, but not to ideal squares, or not to the places that can help you in the middle game. So right now we have many different ways that we could develop, but Botvinnik chooses the best one. And let me give just three options, and then we'll go to a vote. So I'm going to try to choose three, three nice looking moves in alphabetical order. We're going to go with rook to b1. This is a development move because it puts the rook on a half open file and prevents the bishop from coming out. If the bishop moves, we take the pawn. Bishop to d3. This is a development move. Puts the bishop on a very good square, attacking king side and queen side. It's well protected behind this triangle of pawns. Puts the bishop on a good square. And finally, knight to f3. Develops the knight to a very natural square. Prepares to maybe bring it to an even better square on e5 and follows the principle knights before bishops. Usually knights know where they want to go. Bishops don't know right away where they want to go. Bishops have more options. So that's usually why we bring out a knight before we bring out bishops. So let's put it to the test. Who votes for rook to b1? One person, one brave soul. Who votes for bishop to d3? A lot of brave souls. And who votes for knight to f3? OK, a few brave souls. All right. The answer is bishop to d3, so congratulations to you guys for choosing this one. Bishop d3 is the right move. Knight to f3, incredibly, would be a very serious mistake in this position. I should say very serious. It would be a mistake in this position. This is the, an example of a move that looks really good. It's like what I call a beauty pageant move. It's waving its pretty hands and feet and like, look at me, I'm such a great donkey. But in fact, it doesn't have a clear purpose behind it. Whereas the knight actually wants to be on e2. And we're going to talk about why in just a moment. But we're not going to play knight to e2 right now, because obviously this guy would be bishop pointed. So we're first going to bring out the bishop, and then bring the knight to e2. But now the question is, why? Why is the knight better on e2 than on f3? In general, f3 is usually better. It's more aggressive, controls more central squares. This looks passive. Why would we put the knight on e2? This is a very high level question, so I'm impressed to see so many hands up already. All right, let's go back to, uh, were you raising your hand? No. no, okay, let's go to you. Because if you play the grand F3, you get to play with the bishop on... G4? Yeah. Very good, that's a good reason. And so, mm -hmm. if you move the grand E2, you could block up the F3. Amazing.